singing that for us. Now, as we get our Bibles open now, don't forget, we're going to be here tonight. If you value your kid's spiritual well-being, I'd give you some advice. Have them here at church tonight. Have them here at church. The whole service will be geared toward young people, and we're going to have some for every age, but uh, mainly toward young people. And they'll, they'll get something that'll help them tonight. You know what they need? The kids need to know at an early age that the God of the Bible is real. That's what they need to know. And they're not, going to, they're not going to see that out in the world or feel it. They're going to get it in the house of the Lord. That's what this is for. So don't miss tonight's service. The youth service begins at 6 p.m. We're going to have a little surprise for everybody, all the kids tonight, and so you don't want to miss that. All right, get your Bibles open. I'm going to turn to two places this morning, and I'm going to do a little more reading than normal, so I want you to get your Bible and follow me, and then bring the message. Um, Deuteronomy chapter number 1, and then we'll look at Psalm 106. Deuteronomy chapter 1 first, and then Psalm 106. These are both passages about the children of Israel getting ready to go into the promised land. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1. Do see that D-E-U-T? Deuce, that's where we get our word deuce, two, uh, or, or five, the fifth book uh, uh, in the Bible. And uh, so uh, look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan in the wilderness in the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran Tophel, and Laban, Hezeroth, and Dizahab. There are 11 days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. If you read your Bible and study it, you know what Kadesh Barnea represents, that place of decision. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel, all the children of Israel, according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. You know what he said? Look at verse 8. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. Now, flip over to Psalm 106. You seen that, what I read there a minute ago about that 11 days journey? They said it in the 40th year. Here's why. 106 and verse 
number, oh, I don't know, about nine. Psalm 106, nine. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that aided him. That'd be Pharaoh and them in Egypt. And redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. Remember that? There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praise. Man, they had the office time ever was. They shouted and sang and praised the Lord. But, verse 13, wouldn't you know it? They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. They envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. Look at all the stuff that happened to them. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. And a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the way of the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Now all that right there that I've read describes what we call their wanderings in the wilderness. Now I want to preach this morning on the subject floundering. Flounder, like the fish, ing, floundering. Now I'm going to show you in a minute why I chose that word, floundering. One of the most amazing stories in the whole Bible and, and in history, really, is the story of the children of Israel being brought out of Egypt and their wanderings on the land, toward the land of Canaan. It started by a man named Moses when God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. You understand that? I don't have time to tell that whole story, but God spoke to Moses through that bush. It burned, but it didn't burn up. And God said, I want you to go down there and lead my people out of Egypt. Now, if you know the Bible, you understand that Egypt is a type of this world, Egypt. Uh, and all the way through there, the Egypt's a picture of the world. Coming out of Egypt, the picture of getting saved. Going through right, the Red Sea, a picture of baptism. All of that stuff is a picture of the Christian life and the victorious Christian life and the defeated Christian life, so forth and so on. And uh, the, Moses got spoke to by God at the burning bush. Now, when he went back to Pharaoh, he said, now, God said, I want you to let my people go. Pharaoh's sitting on the throne. He said, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know God. Get out of here, man, before I have you killed. And he said, all right, if that's where you want to be, let there be flies. And buddy, they was flies. You know, the, all the plague of the flies. It'd be like if you woke up, if I could snap my finger and there'd be 50,000 flies in this room right here this morning. That would be maybe seven or 800 on each person. And, uh, I mean, going in your, I mean, they had some flies, buddy. And they hung fly paper up like that right there, and it turned gray like a piece of carpet. And they, and you couldn't, it wasn't nowhere, nothing to get stuck. And they got rid of the flies, and they had the locusts, and they had the, they had all these plagues that played. Well, finally, after 10 of them things, Pharaoh said, all right, get out of here. And Pharaoh never did really get, get his heart right. He claimed to a bunch of times, but never did really get right until finally Moses said, all right, I, I hate to do this, but you leave us no choice. The death angel's coming through tonight. He's going to kill the firstborn. And the death angel came through that night, and everybody in Egypt, their firstborn child died, including Pharaoh. And his little boy's laying there dead, and he said, all right, I've had it. You can go. Get out of here. So God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. That's a picture of the world and its bondage. And they run through the Red Sea. It parted like that. It went through, through, went through there, and Pharaoh tried to chase them, and they drowned. Then the Lord said, I brought you out so that I could bring you in. He brought them out of Egypt so he could take them into the land of Canaan. That's the land that's flowing with milk and honey. That was the Lord's plan for his people. Now, here's what I want you to see this morning. 
it was 11 days journey from there to Canaan. 11 days, right at two weeks. A normal man walking normal speed can walk uh, 30 miles in a day of about nine hours. Right, it's at 15 minutes a mile. I could go from here to, uh, on the other side of Hickory, almost to, almost to Statesville, no, not that far, uh, on the other side of Hickory uh, in a day. Say, say 30 miles, maybe almost to Statesville. Uh, but anyway, uh, they, were, they, were, they were walking, and, but there was a million and a half of them. So they probably didn't make that good a time, but they had eight, uh, 11 days journey. This turned into 40 years. Now look, here's what I want y'all to see this morning. As a matter of fact, they walked, they walked around in circles not knowing which way to go for 40 years. Isn't that awful? I mean, they could have went over there in 11 days. They could have been over there eating grapes that big, eating, having all kinds of blessings, milk and honey and the blessings of Egypt. But because of what they did, they just wandered there. Uh, ain't we been here before? Oh, I've seen that, Lord. And, and one year, two years, three years, not 11 days, four years, 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, around and around and around. You know what I'm going to call that? Floundering. Floundering. The word flounder, is a Dutch word, means flop. And I'm sure that's where that flounder fish got its name. And what that, the word literally means is this. It means to struggle or stagger helplessly, clumsily in water or mud. Like, how many, you've seen, everybody here's seen a fish get in water somehow and get in water about that deep and can't get back in and they just flop. Just flop around. That's the definition of floundering. Flop around, get in the mud. They don't know. They have no sense of direction. They don't know how to get where they need to be. And that's the definition. Helplessly, clumsily, water and mud. Confusion, listen to this, not knowing what to do and completely unable to decide. So the children of Israel, for 40 years, people, walked around clumsily like a fish flopping around not knowing where to go or how to make a decision. If they come out of Egypt here and they didn't go into Canaan for 40 years, I figured it, they could have made that journey 1,327 times. There's 14,600 days in 40 years. At 11 days journey, 1,327 times they could have made that journey. They could have been there 1,000 times and just got there in 40 years. Now here's the sad part. The sad part is that in type is a picture of most Christian people today. Most Christian people today are floundering to say the absolute least. I have been many times. I've been doing this a long time. I've been going to some churches 15 and 20 years in revival. I've been, I went to some 10, 15 years, and every year when I would go back, well, how's things going? And it would be about the same crowd, the same old so-and-so would be there. That same guy would ask me the same question. He, he, he hadn't learned that doctrine from 10. Every year he's still hung up. It's like just flopping around and around and around. No progress, no Canaan, just flopping around in the absolute will. And I hate to say this because I love y'all. You're my favorite people in the whole world. But there's probably about most of the people in this room today. You're not a bit farther down the road with God right now than you was five years ago. You're just floundering around. You're, you're stuck. You're stuck right where you're at. I mean, you should be doing better. We should be making some progress. We ought to be in the Canaan, brother. It's available to every single person, and there's confusion not knowing 
what to decide. I got to looking in my Bible this week and I saw, I thought, why did God's people flounder in the wilderness for 40 years? What made them? I mean, if you, if you, um, if Moses, I imagine, uh, there's a million and a half of them. So Moses went and preached revival at this place. Uh, maybe had a little gathering over here of about 75 of them. And he said, how you people doing? Oh, good, Brother Moses. We're so glad you come. What are you going to preach on tonight? Well, I'm going to preach on the plagues and I'm going to preach on cre- I'm going to be preaching on creation and Adam Eden. And they just sat there every night. Moses, that was so good, so good. And when the revival was over, they was not one di- bit different. They was not one bit closer. Lord, get up the next day and walk around and around in the desert. And the next year Moses come back boy it's good to have you Moses we've been praying for this revival yeah we're really excited about this what are you preaching on tonight well I'm preaching about Joseph down there in the pit oh boy that was good and when that week was over they wasn't a bit different than they was the last revival and the next year that went on 40 years people 40 years and they got saying well uh, boy I, I heard this and you know I heard this and I heard that and they don't know no more don't do no different don't listen if you're not fucking down the road with God right now than you was a year ago. Something, right? You're just flopping. You're just uh, uh, flopping around. Flopping around. I think we ought to call some churches flopping Baptist. Floundering Baptist church. That fit most of them exactly right. Now what made them do that? Why, why, why are you not further down the road than you are? If I, if I stood everybody up in here this morning and I said give me two verses of scripture on sports or athletics If you've been going to church half your life, you ought to be able to do that. You ought to be able to tell me how many chapters are in Genesis. You know who won the Super Bowl? Do you know who won? Yes, I'm telling you. People, listen. What made them flounder for 40 years? I'm going to give you these reasons. Number one. Number one. See, it's not a sin to be dumb, but it is a sin to stay dumb. Amen. Smile at me. Y'all are sitting there like, uh oh, uh oh, we're going to get fussed at. What, what would you do if you was a preacher here? Talk about how great everything is. <laughs> I'm telling you, people, listen, we ought to be on down the road than where we are this morning. Say amen right there. I said we. Uh, listen, I want to say, first of all, this morning, I want to say, first of all, this morning, you know what made them flounder? They doubted God's promises. Over there in chapter 11 and verse 2, he said, Your eyes have seen the great things the Lord's done for you. You saw him on the plagues of Egypt. You saw him open up the Red Sea. You saw all this. You saw it. And then why would you doubt him? We sung there a minute ago. How could I ever doubt it, God? Listen, brother, it brings shame to the name of the Lord. After we've seen his great miracles and after he delivers us out of Egypt's bondage and changes our life. And then we say, well, I don't know. I, I just don't know if the Lord's with me or not. And I just don't know if we can do this or not. And I just don't know if we can make it or not. And I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. And is he able to do this? And then can he do that? And Willie, I just don't know. I just don't feel like the Lord's with me no more. And it feels like this. That, that makes you wonder in the wilderness when you doubt his promises. Now, I'm not talking about working yourself up into a fake faith. I'm talking about what Hebrews said when he said, He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know how you get stuff from God? You know how you get somewhere with the Lord? You believe him. You believe what he said. You will never advance that far doubting what he said he'd do. You have to, but by faith, I'm not talking about working yourself up in the flesh. I'm not talking about like some of these people on TV says, this is believe, this believe, this believe, this believe, this believe, 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 believe. No, you're trying to talk yourself into it. I'm talking about really believing. I'm talking about believing what he said. I'm telling you, he brought you out of Egypt, didn't you? He's took care of you, hadn't he? He's took care. Then why do we sit around and doubt? How could I ever doubted God? You heard Nuke up here singing that a minute ago. How could we have doubted God after what? he's done for. Listen, he's come through too many times. He's been there too much for us to doubt him. Let's don't doubt him. That'll make you flounder in the wilderness. 
vehicles and flounder around. You ain't never going to get nowhere. I know people, they're still sitting on the same pew they sat on last year. They're still sitting on the same pew they sat on five years ago. They said, well, I just don't know. I just, I just don't know. And I, I just don't know. And I, I just don't know. And I, that's, I, that's why they floundered in the wilderness. They doubted him. Amen? If you went and preached 35 revivals at their church, I mean, it would be the same. They're like a stranded ship. They're, have you ever seen a car sitting in somebody's yard and, it, and you can tell it's broke and don't run and grass has grown up all around it and ain't got no tag on it and you say, boy, that car right there ain't doing nobody a bit of good. That's the way a lot of Christians look. Have you ever seen a house that had the windows broke out and weeds that high growing all the way around? And if you ever did cut to all them weeds, you'd find two or three cars. And you say, isn't that pitiful? Isn't that sad? That's the way a lot of Christians look. Stranded. Used to be. Just wasted life. They doubted his promises. Number two. I'll tell you another reason they didn't get nowhere. They fell a lusting. The Bible said in Rome, uh, Numbers chapter 11 verse 4 that the mixed multitude that was with them began to say they fell a lusting. So that means people came out of them Egypt with them that really wasn't uh, of Israel. And, and that was okay. They became Jews, a lot of them, spiritually. And they said, uh, y'all, y'all want to go with us? God's going to kill this whole crowd. And they said, sure. We'll go. So they all took off, and they started running out through there, and they started going across through there. And that mixed multitude that was with them, they got out there, and, and God had a special way of feeding these people for 40 years. Somebody tell me what that was. Manna, Manna right. Manna was a substance it was bread and every morning when they got up the manna would be laying on the ground on the dew anywhere there was dew there was manna and God fed them 40 years in the wilderness and took care of them so they get out there and they'd eat it and that mixed multitude started they're sitting around one day and they said uh, you know what I sort of miss that stuff we ate in Egypt I miss them Doritos that's what it says garlic and onions, and leeks. Anybody know what a leek is? Look it up. It's like a little bulb thing like an onion. And uh, they said, we missed the garlics and the leeks and the onions. Brother, I've been hungry in my life. But I ain't never missed garlic and leeks and onions. I don't eat onions. They stink. I don't want to stink to myself or nobody else. But anyway, if you cook them enough, they ain't got no taste. They ain't no use eating them no way. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, they said, we miss the garlic. We miss the onions. We miss the leeks. We miss that stuff. We miss that stuff. We'd like to. And they got to thinking about it, and they fell a lusting. They got to thinking, man, this old man I ever day, I, I, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of tired of this. I, now, the manna was like coriander seed. That means you could ground it in meal. You could beat it with a mortar, and you can uh, make cakes out of it. It was a taste of honey. Uh, uh, um, Manna tasted like bread and honey. And every day, God gave them a special supply of manna. Now, let me tell you something here this morning. This right here is our manna. We get it every day. Jesus said this, Your fathers did eat manna in the desert and are dead. This is the true bread, speaking of himself and the word of God. This is the true bread that a man eat and shall not die. So every morning, me and you feast. That's our breakfast right there, spiritually speaking. I get up every single day of my life, 365 days a year, and I have manna. Right out of my King James Bible. I did this morning. I'm reading back here in Deuteronomy, actually, in the Old Testament, and I'm in the book of Acts in the New Testament, and I feed my soul with manna. Does uh, my body don't always like to? I don't always jump up saying, boy, I want to read the Bible today. I don't always do that. But I know that that's God's provisions for me. Uh, while I'm in this wilderness, in this old world, then I, want to, I don't want to live defeated. I don't want to live doubting God. I want to eat what he's given me to eat and not crave the old wicked stuff that they have back in Egypt. Now, I'm getting there. You just hang on for a minute. 
Instead of shouting the victory in Canaan, they walked around defeated and with no victory and no power for 40 blessed years. People, you want me to cut to the chase here and say what I want to say? You don't want to live your whole life just floundering around, floundering around, floundering around. Never no victory, never no power. You come to church, you see people shout, you see people get on fire, you see people think, you think, boy, I'd like to have that, I'd like to have that. But you're just walking around and around and around and around in circles getting nowhere, no progress. I don't want to do that. I want to get up and feast on the manna from heaven, from the Word of God, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, I, you know what the Bible said about that? It said the Lord's anger was kindled greatly. You want that straight? It makes God angry when you get up in the morning and instead of getting that book open, you first thing you do is get on YouTube or on TV and find out what they're doing out in Egypt. You will do nothing but flounder around your whole life. You say, well, you're getting on me. Yeah, I sure am. And I'm going to get a little bit more on you here in just a minute. I'm telling you, people, your life is short. You wouldn't believe how fast you're going to get 30 and 40 and 50. I mean, it just keeps getting faster and faster. Life is too short. I mean, the world, the world has a pull on you. Watch this. Watch this. I, right now, I'm going to get away from this world. Here I'm going, I'm going outer space. You know why I can't do that? It keeps pulling me back down. Why is it it keeps pulling me back down? How come I can't get away from this thing? Somebody tell me what pulls me down. Gravi scientists don't know what that is. There ain't a scientist in the country can explain gra gravity. You know why that's there? Everything you can't see is a picture of something you can see. The world has a pull on you. Watch this. You show you a scientific experiment? That's a scientific experiment. And if I drop that thing 10,000 times, you know how many times it's going to go down? 10,000. That's proof that the world pulls. And when you drive down the road, or you turn that radio on, or you turn that TV on, nod you, can't you feel it pull you? Yes, you can. And if you can't, you're either lying or you it's already got you. This world pull on you. It'll pull on you. It'll say, don't you miss me? Look here what we come out with. And sometimes you look at black words on a white page and then you look at a boom, 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 boom. And you say, wow, I sort of missed that. And the Lord said, okay. You fell a lusting. And you are not one bit further with God this morning than you was this time last year. Or the year before, the year before. I'm not saying you're not saved. They were God's people. They just couldn't get nowhere. And the reason they couldn't get nowhere is because they were lusting after the things of Egypt. Can I say something to y'all this morning? People, listen, you don't have to know every blessed movie that comes out of Hollywood. You don't have to see everything they come out with. It don't matter. It don't matter. Oh, have you seen this one? Now, I know it's got a bunch of cussing in it, and there's people getting naked in it, but it's really a good movie. No, it is not a good movie. It's a, and The devil gets, puts the good stuff in there to get your attention. Hey, hey hear me. Now, now there, there's people sitting in here this morning say, Brother Danny, why do you have to get on? Honestly, people, do you think a preacher, what, what would you think of a preacher that didn't think that was wrong? What, what would you think of a preacher I bet you if you saw me doing it, you'd think it's wrong. I bet you if you come to my house and peeked in the window and I was sitting there and there was naked people in bed, you'd say, oh, did you see what the preacher was watching? Well, let me tell you something, buddy. If it's wrong for me, it's wrong for y'all too. One, two, three. Boy, some of y'all looking awful uncomfortable. Look, I... I wouldn't, what kind of a preacher wouldn't think that's wrong? You say, well, I know so-and-so, he don't ever preach again. He must be preaching for money. Or he's crazy or something. There ain't no way that can be right. There's no way you can listen to people blaspheme God and take God's name in vain. And, and you know, that's why you're wandering in the wilderness. You're, you're, too, you're wanting, 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine? They're sitting around one morning or one evening, and Moses comes in. Mom, Moses is here. Turn that off. Moses comes in. How, oh, how y'all doing? Oh, boy, 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 let's try to hear something. We were just having a little manna. What does that verse over there mean? They don't know what that one verse means, and they've been saved 20 years. They don't even quote it right or have the right book. Well, I was just reading over there the other day, preacher. Over there in Psalms with the Lord's Prayer. You know, something like that. People do that all the time. Go ahead and laugh. We don't know how dumb you are. You know what? Moses came in and said, Y'all doing good? Y'all doing good? Yeah, well, that's good. That's, that's good. Everything. Then as soon as he leaves, they get on YouTube, punch in Egypt. <whistles> oh, my goodness. Look at that. Oh. You know, that's not Well, I'm not really. I'm not doing it. I just want to see what's going on out there in this world. I'm not doing anything. But the Bible said that you're, if you like to watch somebody do something, you're just as guilty as them doing it. What's this? Lord, it's getting quiet in here. Oh, Lord, you loved it last week when I was talking about them school shooters. Uh, but I'm telling you this morning, that's why they wandered in the wilderness. Number three, they worshiped other gods. They worshiped other gods. He said in verse, chapter 11, verse 16, take heed that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods. Amen. The world's entertained. They went to see every movie that come out of Egypt, brother. I mean, they, Lord have mercy, they had, I mean, they was cussing. They was, I, I mean, there was all kind of uh, ungodly things. They heard Britney Spears' latest song. I mean, they, they wanted to hear Fergie sing the national anthem, whatever she did. That's stupid, that drunk, that poor old pitiful thing. And, uh, and they wanted to hear, uh, they wanted to see this and what Justin Bieber was doing. And they wanted to uh, see what they're And they said, I just want to see, I just want to see. Now look, people, I know we're in the world. I know we're in the world. I got to go out there and live in that same world you do. But we are not of this world. We are not of this world. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured our sight. We're supposed to keep our eyes on higher ground. We're supposed to turn away from sin. It's impossible to get away from it. It's impossible to get away from bad music. It's impossible. But you don't have to deliberately feed yourself on the garlics and the leeks and the onions from Egypt when you could be eating uh, manna on Canaan's land. Ladies and gentlemen, you could be having grapes and good stuff. When a man says he can't stay awake 45 minutes in church, if he can go home, read the whole newspaper, and watch a three-hour ball game, who's he trying to kid? When a man says Sunday's my only day off, I talked to somebody like that yesterday. Coming to church tomorrow, Sunday, I do my washing and ironing on Sunday. That's what she said. Send the kids on the bus. When a man says, I can't get up early enough to make it to church, but he can get up at 4.30 and go deer hunting or go fishing, or, who's he trying to kid? When a man says, the church seats are too uncomfortable and will go sit in bleachers for three solid hours, watching people going down a field, who's he trying to kid? If absence makes the heart grow fonder, I know some people sure must love their church because they ain't been in a month of Sundays. I'm telling you this morning, they worshiped other gods. And number four, I'll tell you what else made them wonder in the wilderness. They were not thankful for God's provisions. You know, the Lord puts a big importance on people being not thankful. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. It said, when people complain, the Lord heard it. We're living in a world where most Christians complain a lot. Well, I ain't this, and I ain't that, and how come we can't do this? And he's fine. we don't, how come we can't do? Listen, listen, people. You could be having a whole lot worse than what you're having. Things could be a whole lot worse. You ought to get down on your face and thank God that you ain't in hell this morning. And you ought to thank God you ain't in a hospital somewhere with tubes running down your throat. And brother, then you'd have something to worry about. But I'm telling you this morning, God's been so good to us. He's blessed us so much. Uh, they complained, they complained, they were unthanked. I, I get so tired of hearing people. I talked to somebody uh, 
a couple months ago, and then they said, we want to go to Charlotte, 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 because Charlotte's a big city, and I, they, they, they think Charlotte is everything in the world. I want to go to Charlotte, I want to go to, listen, I've preached, I've been in Charlotte a bunch, I wouldn't care if I've never seen Charlotte again. There's nothing in Charlotte that I'm interested in. There's something wrong with a Christian that wants more of the world, the world, the world, the world. And I'm not saying you, there ain't things you can enjoy. I'm not saying it's wrong to go eat out. I'm not saying that at all. We're in the world, but we shouldn't desire the world system and lifestyle and, and attitude. I'm not saying we can't go on a picnic. I'm not saying we can't go places and enjoy and do it right. I'm not saying that at all. But you can't let your heart be turned after other gods and not appreciate what God's done for you. I meet people that talk the same today as they did 15 years ago. Don't know a bit more Bible. Ain't one a soul. Just one like this. Flop. Your Christian life is a flop. You're just flopping around for years and years and years and years. Most of these people died in the wilderness. And most of you people right here listen to me and hear this message on radio and internet will die never really having the victory and enjoying your Christian life like you could. You'll die. You know why? Because you will not let go of Egypt and you still got it in your heart. Never will. And you're getting cheated. You're getting cheated. I'm telling you, I've had it both ways. And you're a whole lot better off just let go of whatever's wrong and can put your life in the Lord's work. We got we was here yesterday and about visiting. And Carrie called me and said they was going to watch uh, Billy Graham's body come through, you know. And we got through the bus route. So some of us come over here and got out in the church parking lot and watched as that funeral procession came through yesterday. And... Uh, Man, you talk about some thinking, I was doing some thinking. And I'm not, uh, we had to talk about Billy Graham Wednesday night. If you wasn't here, you should have been. And uh, I was seeing that going down through there, and I thought, my, 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 my. How different some people's lives are than others. There's people who live their whole life in this world. And some of them are saved and never amount to one hill of beans for God. Never do nothing. Never witness. Never become a part of anything. Just flounder around your whole life. If I was you this morning, you know what I'd do? You don't have to come down here. You can. But I'd get right there and I'd bow down and I'd say, Lord, I don't want to waste my life walking around in circles. Make me effective. Help me to do something. And if you'll do that, he'll bless you for it. Well, life's too short to waste, okay? Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to sing in a minute. God's speaking to your heart. If the Lord's speaking to your heart right now, right now, I want to watch you play softly. We're going to pray. I wonder... There'll be somebody here this morning while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed say, Preacher, I know good and well God spoke to me this morning and I don't want to just flounder around in the wilderness. I want my life to mean something, to influence somebody. Please, pray for me. I need prayer. Would you just let us pray for you this morning? Just slip up your hand. Take it right back down. God bless you. God bless you. Hands all over the building. Amen. Amen. Hands all over the building this morning. You just get down here and get down on your knees. Maybe you're here this morning and say, I, I don't want to just flounder. You're going to be dying pretty soon. And you're going to look back and say, you know what? I ain't done nothing for God. I don't want to just flounder. The devil will keep you busy with garlic and leeks and onions of the world. And you won't get nothing done for God. Heavenly Father, help us this morning. Bless this invitation. Do what needs to be done in every heart and life. We'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake.
Amen. Amen. Let's sing this morning. You need to come. Come join these on the altar. Somebody come pray with this man. Somebody else come. You need to come.